families in that zone. Um, we will have Fletcher Benton's alphabet series in the Weeborg Gallery and a Sweek Karnwath uh, show in 304. So this is going to look a little bit different to you than it would have in the past because we were going to have international like so the ceramic show, but that's going up this summer. So now Tiffany is kind of more standalone. It's a, it's a little bit less connected to the Gilded Age shows that we would have had before. I wanted to show you this. Um, if anyone has walked past my office a couple of months ago, you would have seen this on the floor of my office. And this is a scaled model that I built of the third floor gallery 304. So this is a model on a one to 24 scale. So it actually is scaled to size and everything's just scaled down. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a dollhouse, so to speak. But this um, has the entire layout of the Tiffany show. And I think it will probably stay this way um, as we put it up next year. So I wanted to show you this so that we could kind of walk through the sections together as well, because I, I know as a docent, it's not just about the object, but it's about moving through the space and the visitor experience and really thinking through how the show will play out um, Hopefully you'll be docenting in person next summer. That's the goal. Uh, but this should give you a little idea of the layout of the space. So you're literally looking down over the top of it, kind of like a, you know, an aerial view. So in terms of the exhibition itself, the exhibition has been traveling around the country for about two years. So there is information online um, for the other institutions that this show has already been at. It is currently at the uh, University of Georgia Museum and it's kind of stuck there right now, quarantine. So if you Google the show title, you will find images online of other institutions where the show has been. Most of the objects are from the Driehaus collection, but I am going to be including a few Crocker collection items into the show. So I'll talk about that as well. The show is broken down into five sections, and these five sections or themes were dictated by the Dream House. So these are coming from the show itself, not directly from me. So nature is always beautiful. Poetry and glass, the art vase. Beyond traditions, innovations in glass. From the ordinary to the extraordinary. And interiors designing for the home. So as you walk through the show, the objects are grouped roughly into these themes, and each theme will have a large um, kind of didactic panel that talks about the theme and how these things are grouped together and those sorts of things. So in terms of nature is always beautiful. Uh, we know that Tiffany found inspiration in the natural world, and I should say at the outset that the whole entire show is based on Louis Comfort Tiffany's output over the course of his career. So as many of you are probably familiar, um, Tiffany is the son of uh, Charles Lewis Tiffany, who is the founder of Tiffany and Company. So there is a connection between Louis Comfort Tiffany and Tiffany and Co. And that will be talked about within the exhibition as well. Um, but Louis didn't want to go into the family business right away. He was much more interested in painting at first. So he started out at the National Academy of Design. He painted extensively. He went on a grand European tour. He went to North Africa. Um, his paintings were kind of accepted into the academy and he started out that way. But then he transferred over his interest to kind of material culture um, items that are much more based in interior design and the home. And then he went from interior design into specifically glass making. Tiffany never actually blew glass himself. So he never actually really touched the glass works. What he did was employ a whole bunch of people to do that work for him. So a lot of people think that Tiffany designed every object that he literally crafted it with his hands and none of that is true. He basically was the entrepreneur or the businessman behind all of these things. He designed some of them, um, but he employed a whole studio of designers. He employed glass cutters. He employed glass works to blow the glass. 
Uh, so what you're seeing is really companies output in the larger business sense. And so I think that's something that might be really interesting to talk about with visitors, because I think it's not always clear that that's the case. Um, he did employ numerous women in his glass designing and glass cutting departments. Um, Clara Driscoll and Agnes Northrup will be talked about in the show as well. So there's some nice um, kind of segues between the objects and kind of the business side, the design side that we'll see throughout the show as well. And I'm happy to answer questions about that too. So the first um, section, nature is always beautiful. So the idea behind the show is that Tiffany found a lot of inspiration in nature. So we see a lot of flora and fauna, we see landscape scenes, we find kind of repeated patterns from nature within his objects. He has a lot of references to um, dragonflies and flowers. We see snowball hydrangeas and peonies and wisteria and daffodils. Pretty much any flower you could think of is probably found somewhere in one of these Tiffany objects. We'll also get to see a lot of windows, which I think is one of the coolest things probably about this show. And one that I'm most excited about is that there are seven stained glass windows coming with this show. And they are coming all in their own exhibition furniture. So um, dark wood cabinets, um, dark wood pedestals. It's going to have a very Victorian or kind of Gilded Age feel to the show itself. It will be kind of dark. Um, because we have so much dark wood and everything is also kind of low. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Some of the windows are upwards of six feet tall, but for the most part, everything is going to be lower in the gallery than what we're used to. Um, in Nature is Always Beautiful, we have one window, we have six lamps, and we have three vases. So just uh, to kind of keep in mind how that's breaking down. This is where, in terms of the model, this is where you're going to see nature is always beautiful. So as you enter that main entrance space, the tidal wall will be here. And then most people, I would venture to say, turn right as they enter into the gallery. And this is where nature is always beautiful will be. The lamps will be along the curved wall on the side and grouped together. All the lamps are going to be plugged in and will be illuminated. So you will get to see the lamps as they would actually be used. But something also to keep in mind in terms of the space is that everything like a lamp will have a stanchion in front of it because it will not be behind plexiglass. It will just be sitting on the pedestal. So there's some fragility and kind of safety issues there, but I think it should be really beautiful in terms of actually seeing the glass kind of illuminated in that way. Just to give you an example of some of the lamps in this section, we will have an 18 light lily lamp, which is one of the kind of best known from Tiff Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. We'll also have a, a clematis lamp here on the right hand side. So it gives you some of that variation in terms of what you'll be seeing um, in the space. Tiffany's lamps, um, primarily the shades are made of glass and the bases are made of bronze and they are hollow usually so that's another way to tell a true tiffany lamp is a hollow base with markings on the foot of the base and then the glass lamp itself um, some are very colorful um, others a little bit less so i wanted to show you the landscape window that will be in this section it's amazing um, I've seen this show before, so I can attest to the fact that in person it's even better. You can really see the details of his uh, use of opalescent glass and mottled glass and really like the depth that he achieved in the space itself. So you'll get to see, I think the lamps are probably, the lamps um, in conjunction with the windows are pretty amazing to see. The windows are also going to be illuminated, so they will be backlit. So you will get to see the way that the glass and the light work together, which was really the intention of the windows from the beginning. Um, most of these windows were private commissioned windows originally that would have been in houses. Uh, Tiffany did a lot of ecclesiastical commissions um, for churches, which he's well known for a lot of his stained glass windows in various uh, church environments. But we only have one religious window in this show. The other six are all like landscape scenes, nature scenes, um, private commission windows. The second section is poetry and glass, the art vase. So 
he did uh, perfect two types of glass during his career. One is fabrile and the other is opalescent. And these techniques create kind of an iridescent through the use of metal oxides. So one thing to keep in mind is that pretty much all Tiffany blown glass is fabrile. So this is really just meant to mean handmade. He made up the term. So he trademarked or copyrighted the term, he used the term, but it really just means like handmade glass object. Um, opalescent glass is kind of a, a layering of different types of glass and the use of metal oxides to kind of fuse those together and create an iridescent. In this section, we'll have one window, one floor lamp, seven vases, one paperweight, and one inkwell. So what you're starting to see is that we will have a number of kind of household objects that you wouldn't think about having glass like in an inkwell, but it's a, a really interesting way to think about also the mass production of Tiffany's objects. He had a whole um, line, especially in his later career, of objects that were less expensive than the individualized lamps or windows. And a lot of that came out in um, a desk, like a desk set where you would have a paperweight, an inkwell, you'd have a pen, you'd have a letter holder, those sorts of things. So there are a few of those objects in the show. This is a Jack in the Pulpit vase from about 1907. It's Tiffany Studios. It's going to be to the left of the main entrance. So don't forget, we also have our entrance coming off of the 306 gallery. So if any of our visitors come off of 306, they will actually enter into the art vase section first. So this will be right here. Um, we do have the uh, window and the floor lamp will be on this wall. We have other windows on this space. So the idea behind the layout of the show is that no matter where you enter, you will be um, facing a sight line of a window, if not more than one window. So the windows are really taking the forefront of the layout in terms of welcoming visitors into the space. They're the biggest, they're the brightest, I think kind of the most magnificent. So you'll be kind of hit with a window no matter where you enter or which direction you go in. I wanted to show you the floor lamp. So this is hydrangea floor lamp, also Tiffany Studio. So this will be illuminated as well. You really get a good sense of the layering and the colors and kind of that opalescent idea. On the left is the floral window. So this is the window that will be in this section. And on the right is one of the smaller decorated vases. So we do have a number of miniature vases and these are you know, roughly like this big. So they're going to be very small behind Plexi they're grouped together so that you can have some interplay of objects across one another. We will continue on then as we move in towards the kind of back of the space into Beyond Traditions Innovations in Glass. So this extends uh, the idea um, here that uh, artwork for Tiffany was experimentation in both design and color. Um, he employed dozens of artists, designers, glass blowers, as I said, glass makers. He had his own furnace. He had a furnace in Venice, Italy. He had a furnace in Queens for a long time. Um, he actually had two of his furnaces burned down and he had to uh, get a loan from his father to build them. So he has a very interesting kind of business history. Um, as I mentioned previously, we know that he designed some pieces, but not all of them. Most of his works you'll see in the captions for each object. They don't say Louis C. Tiffany, they say the company name. And he had upwards of 15 different companies over the course of his career. And so they are listed out by company name. If we know the designer, for instance, Clara Driscoll, it will say attributed to Clara Driscoll. So I think that's also an important point to make with visitors is the kind of business attribution and the designer attribution, even though his name is kind of the overarching umbrella for the show itself. In this section, Beyond Traditions, we have one window, six lamps, six vases, one mosaic panel, and one photograph, as well as three candlesticks. So it's a pretty um, interesting variety, I would say, in this section. On the left-hand side, we have fish and waves lamp of uh, 1900. I think it kind of looks like lily pads to me, um, but I think it's an interesting variation on the lamp right around the turn of the century. 
I wanted to show you where this is located in the gallery as well. So this is kind of in the back left is what I would say. So if you enter through the main space, um, as I said, uh, you'll have a window here. You're going to have a window here and you have a window in the back. So if you enter through that main space, you're going to be hit with three windows on your sight line. If you come in from 306 and you make a left, you're going to see this space right here to your left. All the lamps are lined up along the wall, so you'll have that whole wall illuminated with lamps. You'll have the window at the back, and then there's actually a chronology that accompanies this row here, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. I wanted to show you some of these amazing and absolutely beautiful lamps. Nasturtium lamp on the left from 1910, October night table lamp on the right also from 1910, um, so you can see kind of that variation in design in the shape of the lamp shade, as well as the base design. So everything is varied and has subtle differences, even though it might seem like, oh, it's a lot of flowers or repeated patterns, but every single lamp is a variation. And they're very much three-dimensional when you get up close, like the glass itself has texture, um, it's not uniform either. It, some of it's rough, some of it's smooth. It really kind of uh, makes for some interesting variation on the lamp itself. I wanted to show you those candlesticks on the left because you're probably like, what the heck is a Tiffany candlestick? So it, we have actually three candlesticks that have specific names, as you can see in the caption. Um, so we do have a wild carrot candlestick, for instance, and like a pine cone candlestick. So. I think these are really fun to see. All uh, bronze bases and then the actual glass work um, is the green parts that you're seeing, for instance, here in the, in the pineapple or carrot and um, pineapple type candlestick. The miniature vase on the upper right, again, some of these are blown glass. So that's another difference that you could uh, think about in some of your stores, the difference between um, glass objects that are like soldered together versus blown glass, two very different kind of techniques in the glass world. Uh, these miniature vases literally are miniature, so they're very, you know, very small, something you could just kind of hold really easily in your hand. A couple of additional uh, miniature vases, blown glass vases from Tiffany Studios, so you can see that they're they're not perfect. You can tell that these didn't come off of a machine creation, uh, that these are physically blown by a glass blower, um, but they do often have a lot of twirling forms, floral decorations, mixing of colors and patterns and things like that. But all the blown work is individualized, so no two pieces of blown glass are exactly the same. This is probably the most amazing window in the entire show. It is called Landscape Window. It is uh, leaded glass, but it also has quartz stones within it. So when you get up close, you can physically see that there are actually stones inserted into the glass itself. So it has amazing sense of texture and it really pops out at you. Um, we have confetti glass in the trees, which is actually made by embedding small pieces of colored glass into the larger glass sheets. And then we have iridescent glass in the borders. So this, I know when we finally get this show up and it's in the galleries, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time in front of this work because it's absolutely amazing. The landscape scene, the sense of um, foreground, middle ground, background that's created just through sheets of glass, the patterning of the glass itself, the stones in the bottom. Um, one thing I wanna mention with Tiffany is that he, uh, by and large never painted glass. He used glass, like the actual glass material itself to build up things like layers and colors and design. Um, this is where he made a big innovation in the world of stained glass is that he did not paint glass. If you look at medieval glass or Gothic glass or even glass during the Renaissance period, it's primarily painted to gain lines and designs and figures. Tiffany, by and large, did not paint glass. So he used leading or he used the glass itself to create the actual design. It's really amazing in terms of experimentation and innovation. As we move from the extraordinary to the extraordinary, uh, just a few things to keep in mind um, that he 
did work and kind of expand his process as he moved through his career, not just to include blown glass or some aspects of bronze lamps, but he wanted to incorporate glass and metal. Um, so he did have a foundry and a metal shop. He wanted to create those desk accessories, the candlesticks, the jewelry also that could eventually be sold in his father's Tiffany & Co. store. Um, sometimes he incorporated things like abalone or other bits of metal or gems or things like tourmaline and stuff into his design. So he was really working across uh, materials. Um, he did have outlets. So he had a retail outlet in New York, but he also sold some of his Tiffany studio designs at like Marshall and Field, Marshall Field and Company in Chicago, for instance. So um, they were pretty, you know, pretty prolific by the time we get from the 1900s through the like 1920s up until about 1930. So that's the most prolific time when he was working with Tiffany Studios. So you'll hear Tiffany Studios or see that name a lot. And that was really his most prolific period. So right around the turn of the century through the first couple decades of the century. You'll see one window, one altar cross, one jewelry box, one covered box, five vases, and a pair of and irons in this section of the show. So we're seeing the covered box here on the left-hand side from 1905, made of silver, transparent enamel, um, really a beautiful little like box. This is kind of in the sec the middle section of the right hand side of the space, just to give you an orientation on where we're at. Um, I wanted to show you this just to also move us into the next section of the scene, which includes interiors designing for the home. So thinking about functional objects. So that's another uh, kind of key idea behind Tiffany's works that all of these objects, although beautiful, were also functional. So it's kind of marrying those two ideas together, um, kind of dividing that kind of craft and fine art and kind of mixing those two concepts. Um, he wanted things that looked beautiful sitting there, but then you could turn that lamp on and use it to read. And I think that's important within the show itself that all the lamps and windows are illuminated. You would have seen how they would have functioned within the home. In this section, we have again, one window, we have a fire screen, two vases, three lamps, one candlestick, one inkwell box, two humidors and one chair in this section. So you get a sense of what he was creating and using in the home itself. It's in this kind of back right section of the space. Um, so we will have the lamps again along the wall illuminated. You will have the fire screen kind of on this temporary wall here. Some of these little, you might be wondering what these little free floating objects are in the middle of the space. These are pedestals. So these are um, pedestals with small vases, miniature vases or floral vases that visitors can walk all the way around. So we will have pedestals kind of free floating in some of the areas of the space itself. I wanted to show you this amazing geometric window, which is in the show, incredibly vibrant in terms of its colors. The greens are kind of almost like a neon um, type green. It dates to 1890, and it will be part of those sight lines that we see kind of moving through the space itself. So not just floral scenes, not just landscape scenes. Um, we also dealing with sort of ideas of pattern and repetition, not just in color, but also in design. Three floriform vases that will be in the show. And these might look familiar to you because they are very similar to the two floriform vases that we have in the Crocker collection, which are on permanent view, as you know, on floor three. So hopefully there's a nice way to make some connections for visitors between um, the Crocker vases that we have and then the show itself. And I think what's fun too, I know for me, is, is kind of looking for some of the details that are not quite perfect because these are blown glass and they're all individualized. So for instance, the rims are not always perfectly symmetrical and, and things like that. So there can be some kind of fun mixed in there too to kind of look for those slight imperfections. This is the altar cross, uh, dates 1891. So you can see sort of the intensity of detail. Um, it has amethyst in it, it has glass. Um, 
kind of that mixture of metals and materials and then the glass kind of uh, jewels, so to speak, within the piece. Um, and these would have been functional objects, ecclesiastical objects, um, largely commissioned pieces. This is a humidor, dates 1902 to 1910. It's bronze and blown glass. So that's another thing to, for people to think about too, is that glass isn't always necessarily like see-through <laughs> or transparent, uh, that sometimes it can take a, a totally different form. Another one of our large windows, this is River of Life window. It's one of the largest windows in the show. It does include enamel layers of mottled, striated, and opalescent glass within it. And then the bars that you're seeing, which I'm sure you'll get visitors kind of asking about these, these are the letting um, in the windows itself. So this is literally just to hold the glass in place. Tiffany often tried to incorporate the letting into the design itself. Um, but in this case, we have more of kind of that, that barred effect that's creating um, different sections of the window. And then a few, hopefully these are a few fun surprises for you because I'm sure the Tiffany works are looking fairly familiar, things you've seen before, things maybe you've seen photos of, but these are some of the fun additions that I've been able to make to the Driehaus show. So this is what makes our Tiffany show at the Crocker little bit more unique than what you've seen or maybe heard about or seen photos of for different institutions. I had the opportunity to modify this a little bit to fit, I think, some of the themes of the Crocker. If you think about the Crockers, um, you know, being a sort of business family, so to speak, and then being art collectors, I like this idea of Tiffany's business history, not only with his father, but then with his extensive businesses and kind of moving from one medium to the other. So what you're going to see down here, if you look at the lower right hand side of the model, this is a massive, what I call concept map that places Tiffany inside of all of his businesses and his key kind of rotating cast of characters, including his key designers, the people who uh, worked with him, his friends at the time. So I'll show you an image of what that looks like in a minute. So this is going to be a huge concept map that takes up the entire wall in this space. On this side, just to the left, will be a European competitor's case of glasswork. And this will include um, a work by Dallet, a work by Dom Harris and Company. Um, there'll be some uh, Shreve and Moser works in here. So this will place Tiffany uh, not only with his contemporaries in the concept map, but also show him a little bit alongside the European competitors. This was originally designed to kind of link to that art, the Art Nouveau show, but now obviously that's uh, kind of taken a little bit of a different turn, but I like that we have some um, variation and some comparison points with some European competitors. So also be a Lalique piece, and these are all part of the Crocker's permanent collection or like long-term loans to the Crocker. So we're pulling out some permanent collection Crocker pieces in this section. If you look at the top of your screen, um, we will have up here a Tiffany and Company silver service. So an entire silver service that is on promised gift to the Crocker will be on view in this area, along with Jenny Crocker's two Tiffany and Company brooches, which are currently in the Crocker family galleries, which I'm sure you remember. So they're going to move into the Tiffany show for the run of that show to kind of have a little corner here about Tiffany and Company. There will be a big didactic panel that talks about Tiffany and Company and how um, Louis was the son of Louis and that when Louis died, Louis actually took over as artistic director for Tiffany & Co for a number of years. And there's this interconnection with the business and the fact that Tiffany & Co still exists today. So there's gonna be a whole story about Tiffany & Co kind of in this back section of the gallery. We'll also have a didactic panel about uh, Tiffany's um, artistic designers and specifically the women who worked for Tiffany's company. So they were called Tiffany Girls. That's a name that's been coined. You've probably heard before. There'll be a whole panel about the Tiffany Girls. 
On the back left, I mentioned there'll be a chronology. So that'll be a big chronology that's taking up a large part of that wall as well. So some nice, I think, kind of uh, connections to the Crawford's collection and some variations to how the show has operated in different spaces. And this is my last slide, but I just wanted to show you, this is a general mock-up of what the concept wall is going to look like. So it will have, and I know it's a little hard to read everything, but I'll just give you the general rundown. It will have Tiffany at the center of the space. So this is Louis Comfort Tiffany here. And then all of these uh, kind of tan circles right now are the companies that Tiffany created during his lifetime. So you can see they, they will kind of rotate around in a general chronological order. He had many, he changed names often. Um, sometimes he had a company that lasted one year or two years and then he changed the name and moved on to something else. Tiffany Studios, or um, as I said, the longest running of those companies ran from roughly 1902 to 1936. That was the longest run. Now the little heads that you're seeing here, these are all people that were contemporaries of Tiffany, who worked with Tiffany, who were employed by him or connected to him in some way. And they will include the individual's name as well as sort of their profession or how they were connected. So you'll see something like writer or art collector or designer, for instance. So it's a nice way, I think, to bring some of the people and faces and businesses to life within the show that wouldn't be represented otherwise. So this will be a huge, huge concept map within the exhibition. So I'm not sure where I am with time, Mallory, but hopefully there's a few questions and a little bit of time left to answer, um, answer what's on your mind. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Jamie. We didn't have any questions come through in the chat. Okay. So what I can do is if you would like to ask a question verbally, uh, just kind of wave your hands like this so I can see in the grid that you have one and then I will unmute you one by one and you can ask your question. So if you have your question, start to flail around. Okay, I'm going to go to Cat Crow. Go ahead, Cat. Um, when he uh, used other pieces of glass, was it like very thin layers that he stacked or did he sprinkle in color? That's a great question, uh, both of those. So when we think about like the opalescent glass, for instance, or kind of the fused glass, that's all really thin layers of glass that are literally, literally kind of soldered or fused together. The confetti glass, for instance, is little tiny pieces of different colors of glass that are kind of thrown into the single sheet that then literally make it look like confetti. Um, yeah. Kind of reminds me of those uh what do they call funfetti cupcakes <laughs> with like the literal like pieces uh, mixed in so he did both and you know he used a number of glass suppliers um, one of those was in kokomo indiana he had his queen's factory and then he had a whole studio of glass works that was completely um, organized by shade like by color um, by type of glass by size of glass so um, he was pretty anal in that sense but it made it made it very usable and workable for his designers when they needed to pull something out and and actually you know take a piece of glass and use it okay thank you yeah sure anybody else with a question i see barbara has a question barbara okay uh, go go uh, ahead barbara yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. I was fascinated by the designer aspect of um, uh, of the business. And you put it in, did you mention Victorian, Jamie? I have always put it more toward the art nouveau arts and crafts, which is where I have seen it used. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a a duking it out amongst art historians on where you can place Tiffany a little bit. Um, the Victorian period is, is probably more in thinking about the general time period in which Tiffany was active. Mm -hmm. And that probably covers his um, earlier businesses best when we're thinking about like the late 1800s. So Gilded Age 
which really overlaps with the Victorian and American art history. Mm -hmm. He's not really arts and crafts so much if you think about like green and green or like the gamble houses and things like that. Um, there's some overlap with Art Nouveau and you'll see that with the European competitors case and then also with this summer Art Nouveau show. Mm -hmm. um, but that's more I think when you get to the early 1900s. So he really spans both of those time frames, and a lot of it's dealing with how do you discuss the time period versus how do you discuss his actual style. So that's something to maybe keep in mind a little bit too. Mm -hmm. And something that'd be really fun to talk with in terms of visitors is like the terminology aspect of the show. Um, mm -hmm. How do we classify the work? He had such a long career from basically the 1870s when he starts painting all the way through the 1930s when he dies. So we're dealing with like a 60 year artistic career and, and styles and movements and time periods are kind of changing. So I, I think you're totally right to link him up with the Art Nouveau. I think he does overlap um, with American Gilded Age and kind of American Victorian period, especially mm -hmm. with some of his house designs and things like that. Hopefully that helps Barbara answer your question. I had another question about did he did he um, sort of give carte blanche to his, those who designed for him or did he did they design something and he said well I don't I don't you're going to have to tweak that a little bit I don't care for that design or did he just say hey go for it he usually said hey go for it and then show me your design so that I can kind of check them off tweak it mm -hmm. yeah so he employed numerous designers at once mm -hmm. um he had a whole team so there was not just one person designing but you'd have right. for instance like a whole lamp department where people were responsible just for the lamps you'd have a window a department where people were responsible for windows you'd have a lead designer and then all the people kind of underneath the lead designer mm -hmm. so it was pretty bureaucratic and you know set up in sort of a systematic way he usually had final say. He wanted to see the designs drawn out. So there are examples um, from Agnes Northrup and Clara Driscoll of actually like watercolor or ink drawings that can show some of the lamps in their sort of design stages. And then he would look at those, make changes or pass them off and then kind of move on from there in terms of creating the lamp itself. But the um, windows were usually on commission, were they not? Yes, the windows were typically on commission, either for, as I, I think I mentioned, ecclesiastical, so like a church commission, right. or it would be a private residence. So we're talking about the upper echelon, primarily in New York City, but kind of up and down the eastern seaboard for kind of mansion houses during mm -hmm. this period. Um, and they would have been designed for specific locations in a specific house. So Jamie, we had a question come through in the chat. Can you tell us any more about his personal life? Did he have a spouse? Did he have children? Oh yeah, great question. Um, Tiffany was married twice. He was married um, to his first wife and she passed away like shortly after childbirth. And then he married his second wife and they had numerous other children. So, oh, I'm blanking on the exact number, but I think he had at least five children over the course of his lifetime. Um, his, he, he named one of his, his daughters Comfort Tiffany, like after himself, which I think is funny. Um, and they all kind of went on to be part of New York's like upper society. They actually, his wife, his, let's see, his second wife and his daughter, let's see, Comfort actually married, if you look on this concept map on the lower left hand side, these are the Gilders. This is Richard Watson Gilder and Helena Decay Gilder. And they, he was a magazine editor during the time and an art collector. And he promoted um, Tiffany pretty heavily during this period. And Tiffany's daughter actually married into the Gilder family. So there's a lot of like, you know, interconnection on the, on the personal side as well. Um, he had a fairly, we think he had a fairly good relationship with his father over the course of his lifetime. His father bailed him out a couple times and failed business ventures or helped him rebuild the glassworks. So he benefited from his father's wealth and money. Um, 
Tiffany's very first interior design project was actually designing um, the like rooms of a mansion that he shared in New York City with his entire family. So they had, it was I think three to four level mansion and each uh, branch of the family had a different level. So he lived with his parents uh, for a period of time and kind of interior designed their house and, and things like that. So as far as we know, there was a fairly good familial relationship, but Tiffany by and large stayed out of the business until the Tiffany and Co business until his father passed away. So hopefully that gives a, a little smattering of biographical details. And um, Susan has her hand raised. Go ahead. Let me see if I can get you unmuted. Okay, okay go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a really good biographical novel about um, Clara Driscoll um, that I'm um, hearing these questions and some questions of my own um, is does a really good job of personalizing the whole relationship and it's based on her letters. So there's a lot, there's a lot of biography in it, um, although it has to be called a novel, but um, I cannot for the life of me remember the name or the um, author, but I will send that to Mallory if anybody's interested. It really gives a, an excellent background of the whole idea of the artist's studio and the different dynamics that can go on there. Um, Jamie, you're probably familiar with it. Yeah, it's called um, Clara and Mr. Tiffany. That's it, yeah. It was a big New York Times- Sarah Virulin. Sarah Virulin. Yeah, Susan Vreeland. Yeah, Susan yeah. yeah. Vreeland, yeah. So I don't have it, it's loaned out, but I don't know if, do you agree? I, I just thought it was a really good background about how that whole business worked. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. you know, I think of the fact that it's based on the letters that were found yeah. um, not too long ago, kind of early 2000s, the letters mm -hmm. were found in some archives and kind of pulled up from there. And that's where the whole Tiffany girls concept came from was actually from Clara Driscoll's letters and and yes. i agree it's a good it's a good kind of primer on tiffany's world and um i think fairly accurate not 100 yeah that's a good reminder thank you jamie you check in and you check out would you would you repeat the name of the book clara um clara and mr tiffany thank you the By Susan Vreeland, V R E E L A N D. Any other questions for Jamie? No. Looks like I'm Patty excited. might be trying for one. I know. Um, mm -hmm. Patty, were you going to ask a question? No, maybe not. Um, Jamie, do you mind stopping your screen share? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I am Mallory, if we, I don't know what time we're at, but if we have other time, I can answer other questions if that would be helpful. Oh, like just about anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions generally for Jamie, maybe about um, curatorial or anything like that? I, oh, Sarah does. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Well, I had one on the exhibit because, um, mm -hmm. Because I remember I, I watched the, the evening when you talked about how you design an exhibit and, and you again referenced like we walk in different entrances and people tend to turn right or they turn left. And we've had exhibits where people turn right and we're really at the back of a storyline of paintings mm -hmm. and they're completely confused. So do you have any suggestions about how this one, because you have a lot of informational stuff toward, toward the back, depending on which way you come in. Mm -hmm. you might miss that whole big wall if you go left. And yeah. I'm just wondering how you would, problems you, we might run into touring people. Hmm, that's a good question. I, I think with this show, the good news is that there's not a linear timeline to the exhibit. So no matter which way you enter, you should be okay in that sense, because I think you, you enter into a, sort of a theme and each theme group has a didactic panel, so you should be able to point people kind of towards that original theme and kind of move on from there. So I think that's helpful. Um, another thing is that I will have kind of vertical panels that say Tiffany on them, so you do know that you're entering a completely different and new show no matter which space you go in from. 
Um, I think one thing to keep in mind, and this is a great question, if you enter through what we consider to be the main entrance where there will be a wall text, and then you do turn right, which is kind of the natural flow for most people, you will have that big concept map, which I think is a really nice place to start just because it gives you a picture of Tiffany and you can kind of see his, all his businesses and his world and it gives you kind of a sense of, of where you are, I think, in time and space. And for me, as not just an art lover, but a history lover, that kind of helps for me to set the stage of, okay, who was this guy? Why should we care? Who were the people around him? And what should I be looking at? So if you can enter through that main space, I think it might help to set the stage from a history standpoint. Um, so that can be a little harder if you enter off of Gallery 306, um, the kind of side entrance. But I, I will say that if you do go that way, there will be the chronology on the wall. So if you wanted to kind of go first towards a historical context, you'd have that opportunity okay. to the chronology in the same way. Okay. I have one other question. Why so many companies? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, you know, he went in and out of business partners quite a bit in the early career. So he started off doing interior design with Lockwood um, DeForest and then also um, with a couple other business partners, um, one of whom was a woman as well. So uh, he changed names, I think, because he was kind of making his way through um, the business world. And then he had different businesses based on the medium that he was working in. So like, for instance, a decorating company versus a glass company, or like textiles versus um, what finally became like more of a studio concept. So he started out small, he started interior design, and he started off primarily with things like chairs and textiles and materials. And then as he branched and moved towards glass, I think he kept refining the company name in order for people to recognize kind of what he was doing and what they were getting into when they were working with his company. So okay. that's, right. that's Disregard the best gesturing. There was some noise in the background. <laughs> I like a good, I like a good hand, hand gesture. <laughs> Barbara? Barbara, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, if nobody else has uh, one quickie, Jamie. Uh, mm -hmm. Touring with kids, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, Tiffany to adults is, I mean, we all know it. But um, uh, obviously, color, shape, flowers, um, those come to mind quickly. Any other hidden tips? Hopefully, we'll have children by then. Yeah, uh, I mean, definitely, I would say look for like bugs and signs of life. Oh, bugs is good. That's yeah. really fun, like the dragonfly lamp and things like that. Oh, I haven't thought of bugs. Out. Yeah, it's very good. Um, I really love to do kind of like the like a kid scavenger hunt might work well, also for things like the quartz stones and the rocks that are in some of the different mm -hmm. objects. So you might have fun with that, and also there might be some ways to relate. Um, for people of all ages to functional objects in their own homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like, how does the kid have a lamp in their room? You know, what does that mm -hmm. lamp look like? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any of the colors or shapes or things you mentioned, Barbara, like mm -hmm. reflected in that? Because I think a lot of, especially kids, they don't think about a lamp being a work of art. So right. Like, how mm -hmm. can you make that connection between something that they might use or throw around at mm -hmm. their house to something that's in a museum, and that might be different than how a painting might respond. That's a good one, yeah. Um, one thing that's really fun, and Barbara, this is a little bit of a tangent to your question, but might be fun for everybody on this call with especially a group of adult visitors, is to talk about Tiffany knockoff and um, <coughs> Tiffany and like literally fake Tiffany's, which are all over the place. You can buy them online right now if you want. Um, right. and what, is, what does it mean to have a Tiffany lamp versus a Tiffany inspired lamp and, and things like that. So I think that's always fun because many people ha think they've seen a Tiffany, but what they've seen is like a reproduction lamp mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. And what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. okay, it's not a Tiffany question, but I wonder if you can Bill, listen, give us a sneak peek about what you have coming up in terms of exhibitions you might be excited about. Oh, putting me on the spot, Sarah. Um, so I've got, I know of one, that's why. <laughs> I've got a really, really big, like the next year for year and a half for me is kind of crazy. So um, 
everybody on this call is going to be stuck with me a lot over the next year and a half, whether you like it or not. Um, so I've got a couple shows actually that I'm super thrilled about. I mean, Tiffany is going to be great. You know, we're really hoping for a big crowd, a really fun crowd with that. At the same time, we have the big National Academy of Design exhibit. So those, um, that's a huge painting show coming to us from the National Academy of Design. Tiffany and that show will be up at the same time. So it's gonna be one big American summer um, next year. So those are gonna be kind of blockbuster. But the shows that I'm really thrilled about that are more collection based, like Crocker collection based that I'm curating um, a show that's now titled um, Towns, Trains and Terrain, Early California Prints from the Pope Collection. And that's coming up in January, um, January 2021, so next January. And this is a big, huge gift of about 200 prints that we received recently that are all early California prints. So a lot of early San Francisco, early images of um, like towns, trains, social scenes. There's some San Francisco earthquake works and things like that. So this is going to be a really fun collection space show that I think should be really interesting in a nice early California collection in January. And then coming up at the end of 2021, a show that I'm thrilled about that some of you might have heard me talking about because it's very close to my heart, it's going to be a Marion Post Wolcott photography exhibition. So Marion Post Wolcott was uh, worked with the FSA during the Great Depression. She was the uh, I'm woman photographer in Roy Stryker's group of 10. Actually, Dorothea Lang was in that group as well, but Dorothea Lang was only part-time. So this will be great. The Crocker owns like 60 Marion Post Wolcott photos. And so this is gonna be a really, I think, fun, um, it's hard to say fun with the Great Depression, but it'll be, I think, a fun show for me in terms of um, putting our photography collection kind of at the forefront. So that's coming for me. Please, Sarah, that answers your question. Yes, I'm excited. Some of that was new news for me, but I was really excited to hear about the photography show. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled about that show. Great. Well, Jamie, I really want to say thank you to you for all of this, and thank you to everybody for tuning in. Yeah, a round of applause for Jamie. <laughs> it was fun. It's nice to see folks and hopefully give you a little sneak peek. I know a year seems like a long time from now, but hoping we're all back together then and it's just around the corner. So. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope. Thank you, Jamie. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. And thank you, Mallory. The, um, yes, you too. Thank you, Mallory. Week.